talk. It's on. It's on? Yeah. Okay, can we start then? It's time to start. Okay, okay, so good afternoon and welcome to the um, SCCP Safer FD UNESPI Colloquia series. So today we're very pleased to have our own Deepika Jain, not on. It's not, she's not be on for too long. <laughs> so, so Bitika, um, so Bitika did her PhD in the uh, uh, in the US, as in Syracuse, the Syracuse University, and she was a postdoc at the uh, uh, Korean Advanced Institute, no, at Korean Institute for Advanced Science. Is that right? Kias. 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 Before joining us as a postdoc. So, uh, so Bitika is a postdoc here, uh, but this is actually her last week. It's a kind of parallel <laughs> talk. <laughs> um, so, so she's going to talk about the uh, some work that she has done, uh, electroweak symmetric, electro symmetric dark matter ball. Yep. Okay. If I could read my slide. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, so as the topic is, uh, I'm going to tell you about electroweak symmetric dark matter balls. So these are massive dark matter objects. And uh, we had a lot of fun creating them with uh, Eduardo and Yang Bai. Uh, and this is like very recent. We finished it like uh, mid-June. OK. Well, before I start, of course, I wanted to uh, take a moment to think about Eduardo. Uh, Eduardo passed away very recently, and uh, this project which we did with him was like a very energetic project. We finished everything in three months. Uh, Eduardo was on and off from ICU at that time, but even then we used to spend 20 hours talking just about this project every week. And uh, I have learned a lot from him about how to live and also how to think about physics. And uh, just when I think about him, I also think about this poem. It's called The Invictus, which basically means undefeated. And I think that's what he was. All right, so let's dig in. So here's the outline of my talk. First, I will quickly review what we mean by electroweak symmetry, uh, then introduce dark matter, talk about the various uh, possibilities that you have for dark matter, so different kinds of dark matter candidates, and then specifically talk about the macroscopic dark matter. The one we want to talk about is what is known as uh, non-topological solitons. So we are going to use these non-topological solitons as dark matter. Uh, balls. And then uh, I would use these dark matter balls. I would create them in a Higgs portal setup, discuss, uh, discuss its properties and how you actually uh, keep them stable and how you produce them in the early universe, and then briefly discuss its phenomenology. Okay, so what do you mean by electroweak? Uh, electroweak, as the word me simply says, it basically is the unification of the weak and electromagnetic force. Okay, and uh, this is what we like to think of when we think of uh, the electroweak sector in the Stan model. So you have the you know like 10 to 20 seconds, which is now, which is the present universe. We think we see electromagnetic and weak forces separately, but if you go back in time almost, say, around a few nanoseconds after the universe was born, then they are unified. And this is the electroweak unification that we like to talk about. And uh, technically, this corresponds to a gauge group unification, which is the SU2 cross U1. The SU2 corresponds to the weak sector, and the U1 is the electromagnetic field. So uh, physicists have been thinking that, yes, they get unified, and they've been thinking about this for decades and decades. And uh, eventually, in the 80s, they were able to observe these uh, force carriers for the electromagnetic and the weak sector, so the photon and the W and Z bosons. Okay, 
So uh, what do you mean by electroweak So this is when uh, these electromagnetic forces get unified with the weak force. This is what is known as the glacier weinberg salam model, uh, for, which is the theory for weak interactions, which was proposed in the early uh, 60s. And uh, it's been there since then. And that's after that, you had the Higgs mechanism proposed. And these are the three main uh, physicists for it. So we have a, a unified set of particles. So initially, I said you have the W, Z, and the photon. But when the electroweak symmetry, uh, electroweak unification occurs, you actually have three W bosons, which corresponds to the three generators of the SU2, and you have a B boson, okay, which corresponds to the U1 uh, symmetry. So now, what's this? Yes. But you're not talking unified yet between U1. Are you going to deal with the unified group? No, no. I'm just just briefly introducing the concept of. Electroweak symmetry. I'm not unifying you know, anything. Yeah, but there are two coupling yes. So you have G and G prime. Yes, of course. So so you have these uh, four uh, bosons here, and but we never see the B boson. Okay, we never talk about the B boson. This is how it looks like in the electroweak symmetric setup. However, uh, what we really see is these two massive charged bosons, the W plus and W minus, and a massive neutral boson, the Z boson, and you have a massless photon. And this happens because of the Higgs. The Higgs gives mass to these particles. So the massive Ws uh, are coming basically when the W1 and W2, uh, they, uh, they eat the goldstones, which come from the Higgs sector. So you have the H plus and H minus. And that's how they gain the mass. In the same fashion, you also get mass with the Z boson. So here you have the neutral H0, which is different from the Higgs, which gives mass to the Z boson. And there's no uh, degree of freedom left. And so the photon is massless. OK? And this is how the electroweak symmetry gets broken. And also you get mass for these bosons. All right. Now, let's look at the Higgs potential a little uh, bit more in detail. So uh, the Higgs potential has this uh, specific uh, form. So you have the mu square, which is the bare mass parameter, and lambda, which is the quartic interaction for the Higgs. We, uh, so usually, if you were just uh, looking at some specific potential for a field, uh, if mu square is positive, then this potential would be of this form, okay? So this is uh, symmetric around the origin. The Higgs does not have any vacuum expectation value. And uh, this is a completely symmetric system. However, if mu square becomes negative, then we end up with this Mexican hat potential. And now the, uh, the minimum is no longer at the origin, it is shifted to these plus minus V values. And this is how you have a symmetry broken in this setup, okay? So uh, instead of sitting at the origin, now you are shifted. And if you were to look at the same picture in a three-dimensional scenario, instead of sitting up here, the Higgs would prefer to be down here, okay? So the Higgs uh, usually is written in terms of this uh, doublet form. And uh, you can also take a specific, uh, if you just write in a general gauge, you would write it in this form. And the phi's here are the Goldstone bosons, which are eaten up to give mass to the W's, W's and the Z's. OK, so uh, what is the dark matter? Well, we know that there exists some uh, there, there are you know, significant astrophysical observations which, is, uh, which suggest that you have some non-luminous massive component in the universe, which we call the dark matter. But we don't know what its true origin is, and, but we do know certain things. So there are some known un, uh, things about this unknown particle, if you think that it's a particle. So we know that it is neutral. 
We know that it doesn't have any color. We know that it has to be stable on a cosmological time scale. And we need to have the right abundance so that you, know, you have the, uh, so, so that sets con constraints on uh, the decay channels, the couplings, and the masses if you have any proposed dark matter candidate. In the stand model, you have something which is neutral. It's the neutrinos, OK? And they don't uh, carry any color also. However, they cannot be a dark matter candidate. That's because these neutrinos are fermionic. They, are, uh, they obey the Pauli exclusion principle, so they move very fast. And the speed at which they would move is like way, way higher than what we know the dark matter should be moving at. Okay. And then, of course, uh, if you have to get the right abundance for these dark matter candidates, you need to make sure that they interact in such a fashion that you get the right abundance. So uh, theorists have been working uh, and thinking about dark matter for, for quite some time, and they have come up with different candidates. So you can have objects which are as light as uh, you know, PEV, FEV, way, way, way lighter than an electron. So these are usually the axions, and there are different ways in which you can generate these axions, the QCD axion or ultralight dark matter, pre-inflationary axions, so on and so forth. Then you have, uh, inspired by supersymmetric, you have the WIMPs, which are of the order 100 GV in mass. Then you could always have an extended sector for dark matter, and that's where all these hidden sector uh, scenarios come up. And then you could have very massive objects, like you could think of uh, primordial black holes as dark matter candidates. Okay? And there are various ways in which people have been trying to locate them. Okay, so uh, as we continue our quest for dark matter searches, uh, and we are facing the fact that we haven't seen anything yet, it obviously makes sense to even widen our horizon and uh, think that, okay, you could have not just one kind of dark matter, you could have several kinds of dark matter candidates contributing in different fashions. Some fraction could be axionic, some could be WIMP, some could be something else. So these are the several possibilities that exist. No. Yeah. What? Well, nothing here is hundred percent. It's only a fraction. Okay. Yeah. Who is the author, by the way? This one. This is Tim Ted. No, no, no. This was just the overview of dark matter candidates. <laughs> oh, this was a nature article. Anyhow, so uh, my focus is on uh, macroscopic dark matter, and uh, why why are we thinking about these uh, massive objects? So I was I was mentioning that uh, to get the right abundance, you need dark matter to interact with the standard model is in a specific form. So when we talk about dark matter baryonic interactions, we talk about the interaction rates, which can be written in this following fashion. So it depends on the number density of the dark matter, the cross sections of the dark matter with the, these particles, and the velocity, which is uh, because uh, the number density is basically uh, uh, rho over m. So you could say that this is proportional to the cross sections divided by the mass of this dark matter candidate. Okay, This is what we call as the, uh, the reduced cross-section. So usually we say, OK, this cross-section is very, very small, and that's why dark matter is really dark. Okay, But you could also have the same small interaction rate by making the masses very high. Okay, You scale them up to almost Planck scale, and you can have massive objects there. And you could still end up with small cross-sections. So uh, since we know that the average uh, dense, uh, density for these dark matter candidates is around 0.3 GeV per centimeter cube, which translates to 10 to minus 24 grams per centimeter cube. So if we want to estimate how many events you could have in a year, 
if you even want one event, you could have massive objects as heavy as 10 to 9 gram. Okay? And there have been several candidates for these massive uh, dark matter objects. You have had uh, the primordial black holes, quark nuggets, nuclearites, cue balls, so, so on and so forth. Meaning, uh, if you are observing these events in a detector. Well, uh, let me see how. It does depend on the precision of the detector, but when you calculate the rates, you just. Uh, You're talking about a direct detection, I guess. Yes. Direct detection in what experiment? Like xenon uh, in underground, underground experiments. It does depend, like the details, but it's more like the area of this detector because it's just, a, uh, you, you know, like you have a one meter. So is the detector available today? Is that the idea? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it doesn't depend on the, cross, on the, on the interaction with, with other masses? Well, it does. Yeah. It does. So why do you say it's one ten to the nine zero grams? Well, like there's an unknown coefficient there. Which could so be here, it's, so here you're observing. Well, here it's more like uh, this is interacting with the whole, with the whole Earth. 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 Yes, and with the whole the Earth. Geometric cross section, which is yes. the Earth. So that's the yeah. So these are massive objects. You're just looking at this, the you know, the whole cross section of the Earth. So it's just you're just looking at how many events can be observed on the, entering the Earth. Doesn't it depend on how strong the interaction is with the with standard models? It's a geometric cross section. Yeah. No, but still, there's a there's a the coefficient could be zero, right? It doesn't interact with, with the standard model. It's Nathan, zero. Well, it is a zero. The cross section is the geometrical cross section, which assumes a certain coupling and so on, right? This is a classical scattering, it's not yeah. scattering. So it assumes. So is it reasonable? I'm just trying to ask is this something expected, or is this an assumption that's unreasonable? Well, if, if these objects are so massive, then you have to think of the geometric cross section, and then it really doesn't matter how, how strongly it interacts with the. It's actually Nathan, Nathan, it, it assumes some certain strength of the coupling. Yes. And what is this? So that's what I'm asking. Is that assumption reasonable or not? Well, is it something everybody agrees with, or is it something. No, it's assuming strong interactions. interactions. Yeah. But, but this is just an estimate. Yeah, it's an estimate. It's assumed some. It's an order one. As, I mean, you assume that the interaction strength is order one. Way away. This is not rigorous at all. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, hence the approximate. About this. You, you assume certain uh, cross section, but uh, the experiment set the limit. So you set the limit that you don't observe something. Yeah. And uh, the limit is expressed in terms of mass. That's kind of. Okay. So if this model is correct, that's what you express. Okay, I think I get it. Okay. Actually, I think the right way of saying this is the flux of dark matter particles crossing, crossing the, the earth. earth. That's what it is. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's not even a cross section. It's, it's, yeah. it's just the flux. So it's one particle. You no, know, if, if the mass is 10 to the 9 grams, there is one part, one dark matter particle crossing earth um, okay. per, per year. Per year, usually uh, one year. That's what it is. Yeah. OK. All right. So uh, now I will just uh, <coughs> talk specifically about uh, the dark matter candidates of interest here. So we are uh, using non-topological solitons uh, as dark matter here. Solitons basically mean uh, stable bound states, which are spatially localized. So if, if you see in this picture, the, there is this canal and there's this port going in, and here there is this uh, localized uh, wave here, which is non-dispersive, okay? It, it, uh, it holds its uh, shape for a very long time till it collides with some other object. And these are, so, uh, these are observed uh, hydrodyn hydrodynamically, and this was observed, like, I think in the late, early 50s, or I don't know, several decades ago. And uh, this video, if it plays... shows how they are generated. So 
It's a lab experiment. They just have a chamber with water in it. They just, so that's a solitonic wave. And you see it retains its shape for a significantly long time till it collides with some other physical object. So these kind of objects uh, are created when there is some nonlinearity. Non Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, there's some nonlinearity in your system. Uh, you, they are called. So usually, uh, you have two kinds of solitons. You have the topological solitons and the non-topological solitons. Okay. Uh, the difference between them is uh, on the boundary conditions that you have at, at infinity for these solitons. So for a non-topological system, you would have uh, the same uh, boundary condition as you have for the vacuum. And you don't need any uh, degenerate vacuous states like you need for the topological scenario. That's the only uh, technical difference between them. These, mac uh, these uh, macroscopic objects, they have uh, a bosonic content. So I would be actually using just scalar particles here. And uh, so for a scalar field, we would have some nonlinear interactions between these fields. And this would allow us to generate a spatially localized state, which is, uh, which is just a solution for the classical equation of motion here. So they are also known as the cue balls. And uh, the first time studied by Friedberg and Coleman in 70s and 80s. They have been applied for, uh, to different kind of uh, physical problems. They were used for non-perturbative QCD at low energy, where the hadrons were the non-topological solitons. They were also used to make solitonic stars. Uh, they have been used in supersymmetry. And uh, these objects have been used to explain dark matter candidate. Uh, as they have been used as dark matter. But that was a completely different kind of a setup. And they've also been used as a source for generating gravitational waves. So uh, we are basically generating these solitonic states in a Higgs portal dark matter scenario. What I mean by that is you have the usual standard model Higgs sector, which is these two terms. So you have the kinetic term of the Higgs and the Higgs potential. You extend it by including a, a new scalar field, which uh, uh, which couples with the Higgs field in the following fashion. So this uh, Lagrangian is U1 symmetric, and this allows us to make phi a stable particle, and this is one of the simplest extensions to have a dark matter candidate. Phi here is a complex scalar field. Okay? Then we make certain assumptions regarding these couplings. We assume that lambda phi is positive, and we also make sure that the bare mass is positive. So, uh, which ensures that the physical mass of the phi particle is always positive, even when the Higgs wave is zero. And just for the sake of convenience, we also keep the quartic positive. So, after the electroweak symmetry breaking, that is, once the Higgs gets a wave, this phi field would get the mass of the following form. So uh, for a soliton, we, uh, we need a non-vacuum field configuration. We have to make sure that it stays stable, which is, which is easy to uh, get because of the conservation of the global U1 charge that we have here. And we only look at the spherical symmetric lowest energy solutions. So you already have a dark matter candidate, right? Yes. Phi. Yes, phi. But now we are making dark matter balls, so which will be made it's a composite particle made from the five fields. So you have two dark matter? Yes. In principle, you have two. But we, we have, we, based on the parameter space you look at, and for these dark, dark matter balls to actually exist, you end up in a scenario where the free particles uh, have a very low uh, number density. So they're barely not there. So uh, we look for spherically symmetric solutions. So you expand phi in this fashion and just look at the radial, uh, radial uh, configurations. And the Higgs field can be written in this form. 
And so you have these two equation of motions with nonlinear terms of the following. Mm, no. Phi is a single, right? Phi is a single. And there's no, they don't mix, right? Phi doesn't mix. H would mix, but phi doesn't mix. Phi will mix with C, you know, later, right? Right. But the point is, yeah, people have, I think people have looked at gauge combination of two words, but I think that basically they are just unstable. Yeah. It needs to be a global charge. Okay. <coughs> so you assume the mass to be greater than the, the Higgs mass? Uh, the mass is greater than the Higgs mass. But in principle, but the mass can be anything. It can be anything. Because uh, it, it completely depends on just these two parameters, right? The bare mass and uh, the so lambda phi h could be much smaller. So it can be lighter also. Yes, it would decay into the Higgs, so you have bounds on it. Okay. There is just two symmetry which does not allow a kind of phi to decay. Because you can see that phi enters as a, as a number of phi. Ah, yes, yeah. Phi cannot decay unless it acquires a quantum decay. Yes, which we're not uh, assuming. The Higgs could decay. The Higgs could decay into two phi. Yes, if the mass of phi. Okay. Sorry, yes. The idea is that you have, li you have little balls or big balls. What is the. They're going to be big balls. Yeah. Right. They'll be fairly big balls. Yeah, I'll give you the numbers in a bit. But yes. You say to infinity, that's what, uh, what the here. Here, never balls, right? No, no, no. These are just boundary conditions on, for these equation of motions on the phi particle field configurations, not on the dark matter. Balls. So for, for the moment, I guess you should say for the moment, this is this is like a classical. This field is classical theory. Classical field theory. Field right? theory. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Sorry, yeah. Is this classical? This is a stable solution. You check. Yes, I will. Sh I will show you. Yes. It's stable once you put e minus i omega t and. This, yes, the stability comes from just looking at the energy of these uh, complex objects and comparing it with the free particles. And uh, you, you just need to make sure that the energy is lesser and it would be possible to do that. What, what is omega again? Sorry. So, uh, well. The no? no, not really. It's not the lifetime. Uh, Let me see how to explain. It's just a parameter. That it's just a parameter, charge, right? actually, which is related to the charge. It's not in the Lagrangian. It's a free it's parameter. And it's related to the charge. You solve an equation. It's yes. To the charge. So I'm I'm writing this phi field in this fashion, and I'm introducing this omega parameter in here. So it gives me an additional degree of freedom to play around with the solutions to make sure you get the stable form for these uh, solitons. I think it's related to the energy or mass somehow. It is. It, it, there are relations uh, which relate the mass to this omega, the charge of these objects to omega. So. When I talk about stability, what do you call stability here? What's the definition of the stability of the chemical Hold. Hold your question for a while. So, OK, so you solve these two equations of motion. Uh, using just a shooting method, using these boundary conditions. Uh, we, we pick a specific form of lambda phi h here. Lambda h is 0.13, okay? This is the Higgs uh, sector, so we don't touch this. Lambda phi h, you can vary it. It can be an order one value. We, we choose lambda phi h to be three because that's what is going to give you good numbers. And uh, for this specific value of parameters, we find the following uh, profile for the phi field, this solid line, solid blue line. And uh, this orange line is the Higgs profile. 
So it's just like almost like a step function, but with a uh, with a width of the size of pi over the Higgs web. Okay. So this is uh, this is related to the transition uh, between these two states. So going from the electroweak symmetric to the elect uh, well. I think by mistake I wrote pre preserving on both sides, but here the Higgs uh, has a web, so the electroweak, it's unsymmetric, it, the electroweak symmetry is not preserved here, and this is where it is preserved, okay? The Higgs, is, Higgs web is zero here. These dashed curves are basically for the unstable solutions, okay? Which I will explain to you in a bit, but five profile can be approximated by this simple uh, first, uh, like a Bessel function, and uh, this, is, this can be approximated with a step function also, just for numerical uh, calculations. And different kinds of these profiles correspond to different charges for uh, these soliton balls. And uh, because this is approximately the, uh, the value at which the phi profile tends to zero, you can define the size of this object and that is related to omega, okay? So uh, the smaller the omega, the larger the dark matter ball would be. And uh, the, the charge again for these objects, we have some scaling laws, so an uh, analytical approximate uh, relations for them, they depend on omega in this fashion and also on the size of the dark matter ball. And when you say Q is of this value, this is a large Q. If Q is order one, then it's a small Q. Okay. So till now I didn't talk about the mass. So we're using mean field approximation. And in mean field approximation, you can calculate the mass of these dark matter solitons by using this relation. So here, uh, five primes are the derivatives uh, over R. And uh, VH and V phi are the, the contributions coming from the Higgs portal uh, Lagrangian, so the potentials for the Higgs and the complex scalar phi. So to make sure these dark matter balls are stable, you just have to ensure that the, this relation is satisfied. Okay. So if we plot the mass of these objects, then we see that it actually uh, diverges at a particular uh, at this point. And so you have this orange band, and this orange band stays positive for a while and then goes negative. So the orange is the unstable region. So here, uh, this allows you to, for this dark matter ball to quantum mechanically decay into free states, while in the blue region, uh, this decay is forbidden. And so your dark matter ball stays stable, okay? And this blue region is what corresponded to uh, these solid blue curves that we had here, while the other curves that we have here, these so dash blue curves, correspond to the, the regions where the dark matter ball would decay into free states. Okay, so uh, we used uh, different uh, values for the uh, lambda phi h, lambda h, uh, lambda phi h and lambda phi. And then we were able to generate uh, some scaling loss between the charge size and the mass of the dark matter sol solitons. It's, it's stable for large Q, right? Is that yes, it is stable for large Q. I, I got confused because you said they're unstable going like one over Q to some power, one over Q. Ah, here? Yeah, but that you mean for Q small? Yes, for small Qs. Yes. Why So you want you want the dark matter balls to have less energy than Q phi free states. Oh, okay. Just an energetic uh, Just relation. Just yes. No, 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 no. So yes. So when you have large Q, like Q of the order of hundred or so, and if you turn off the phi self interaction, then you have these scaling laws. So the charge, the uh, dark matter ball charge, it scales to R, R to four. The mass uh, scales to R cube. 
And then uh, using this, we can actually estimate. How do you find the scaling loss? Is this numeric? It's completely numeric. So we ran uh, these solutions for uh, like uh, various values of lambda phi h, and then we plotted, uh, then we computed the charges, and then we just empirically extracted these relations. Yeah. But we fitted them, and they were matching very well to these. Yeah. Do you have any understanding why these relations come about? Uh, well, he... Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, uh, the charge is basically, uh, it's coming from the integral of the current over a, over over the area. So then uh, you would expect at least r square, and then the current would probably give the remaining powers and, because it depends on the field and stuff like that. And the only thing that depends on scale is omega, right? Yes? Omega is the only parameter that depends on scale, right? Are there other parameters that are assumed? No, omega is the only parameter here, yeah. And of course, you have the parameters in the Lagrangian, so lambda phi h and lambda. I think so one should probably be able to, I mean, maybe I'm probably thinking, to obtain scaling laws as a function of omega, and which then is going both ways, I guess. Yes, yes. But because, yeah, omega was a free parameter, not of physical interest, we don't mention it here. No, I mean that you don't need to go to numerics. In principle, you should be able to just, like, n scale some way with omega, and then you scale some way with omega. Therefore, n scale plus is something which you, I think. Ah, OK, yeah. Well, it is. There are other parameters, there are other parameters here. Are fixed, you know, I mean, the only free parameters. Right? Yes. <laughs> These are just scaling laws. This is not equal to this. No, there are free parameters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With, the, with the dimension n that you put before in front of the R cube, that's clear. Yes. The question is that, uh, well, why this efficient kind of independent? It's hard to guess from dimension analysis it depends. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You say the omega depends. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, I mean, uh, you can uh, estimate what the energy density for these objects would be, and uh, it's of the order of 100 GV to 4. If you turn on the self-interaction, then these scaling laws actually change. So instead of R4, it becomes R cube. Uh, instead of Q3 fourth, it becomes Q. So how do you form uh, dark matter balls? Uh, well, we didn't have to think too much because uh, there are some very well-studied uh, possible ways of forming these objects. It was proposed by Witten in the early 1980s. And you can have this by the phase transition. But here he was discussing QCD phase transitions. For us, it is electroweak phase transitions. Okay. So, well, you have first order phase transitions in water. Uh, that's how the water bubbles form. So this bubble formation, it's a first order phase transition. Uh, the bubbles of the vapor, uh, they form, they expand, and eventually the liquid phase gets converted into a gaseous phase. So in the same fashion, in the early universe, uh, you could have a first order phase transition, a first order electroweak phase transition. Okay, so with, uh, where what you would have is first, you would assume that both the Higgs and the spy field, they have no vacuum expectation value. We're assuming a one-step phase transition, which means the spy field never acquires any WEF, only the Higgs acquires a vacuum expectation value. And once that happens, which is basically if you start with this Mexican hat potential, you keep on heating the system, just like you heat water, you reach a particular temperature, which is this critical temperature, at which you have a degenerate vacua, which means there are two, this red, uh, this curve here, and then at the origin, 
these are two degenerate energies. And that is when the breaking of this electroweak symmetry occurs. And then you can have a transition from the, uh, from the symmetric phase to the asymmetric phase, okay? So at high temperatures, you basically have just uh, the false vacuum, okay? And uh, at a critical temperature, now you have two phases, the symmetric and asymmetric phase, or the false and the true vacuum. The true vacuum is the Higgs vacuum. And so these blue, balls, uh, blue bubbles here are the Higgs bubbles, which start growing and forming, okay? And they keep on growing. And eventually, you have this true universe, but you also have some isolated regions in which you could have this false vacuum. And that is where the dark matter balls exist. So some uh, more details uh, about the uh, dark matter formation. So uh, once this dark matter balls isolate, uh, and we want to ma we make sure that the dark matter fraction uh, is uh, such that it's mostly the dark matter balls and not the free fire states. And we actually computed it, and we found that the ratio, that so the number of free fire states that you would have is 10 to minus 265. So it's really negligible. So after this dark matter isolation happens, it's mostly the dark matter balls which exist. And so, uh, and eventually the free dark matter number gets rid of all the symmetric component and we end up with only what we know as asymmetric dark matter. And this occurs around the critical temperatures of uh, 130 GV, which is close to the electroweak phase transition. Then the temperature keeps on cooling down, and eventually the dark matter freezes out at 0.49 GV. And then we estimate what the dark matter uh, ball number would be, and then we estimate what kind of masses of these candidates we are looking for. So these are fairly massive objects, around 10 to 26 GeV. And uh, we vary this lambda phi h from two to nine, and we see that these dark matter balls have a size of around 10 to minus nine centimeter. It's fairly big by particle sizes. Okay. So till a micro, uh, till 10 to minus six centimeters. So, so the freeze out here is different from the usual dark matter? No, it's the same freeze out. It's the same scattering? Yes, you have the dark matter scattering with the stand model particles, which is mediated by the Higgs. So you have a rate for that in compared to expansion rate? That yes, way? the usual way of calculating. Yes. So, uh, so you need that, uh, okay, you need to compute the scattering rates for uh, the freeze out, but you also need it for detection of these candidates. So we studied in detail uh, the scattering of the dark matter balls with the standard model particles. And uh, since we know that the phi profile, the dark matter profile is of the following form, so you have a core which is electroweak symmetric, the Higgs profile acts more like a three-dimensional potential well for the standard model. So this uh, basically reduces to a quantum mechanical problem. So you're basically studying scattering of uh, particles with this uh, 3D potential well, which is uh, parameterized by the Higgs profile in this fa fashion. So we approximate this profile with a step function. So you basically are solving this Klein-Gordon equation in the presence 3D well. The source field is just introduced to, uh, co as a control variable. And we basically are solving this equation. It doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. We're basically uh, just using the Higgs profile here. And it's the interaction of the Higgs with stand model particles. But this R is decided by the profile of phi, right? What's phi? Psi? Chi. No, psi. Maybe Schrodinger Ah, here. Uh, so psi is um, uh, any. Well, I should have used, so psi is any standard model particle that you would have interacting with the dark matter box. So 
it's we we're not treating uh, fermionic or bosonic we just assume it to be a scale, scalar field actually and calculate the cross section rates so uh, we first we look for the bound state solutions and we estimate the bound spectrum and then we see uh, we could assume take different kind of uh, y being the yukawa so you could take different values for the for the neutrinos for the electrons and top and depending on that, you can estimate the size of these bound states for all these objects. And then you compare it with the size of the dark matter ball. And we find that uh, neutrinos cannot be bounded inside these objects, but you could have the top, the electron inside these dark matter balls. So that was about uh, fermions, uh, the top, the electron. But you could also have these dark matter balls interact with nucleons or the nucleus, because that's what you need for uh, scattering, uh, for the direct detection in xenon, because it's dark matter is basically interacting with the xenon nucleus, okay? So uh, there are a few assumptions here, uh, which are fairly valid, because we know that the dark matter balls are uh, expected to be extremely heavy in comparison with the target particles like xenon. Uh, so you can uh, you can take a fixed Higgs background and work in that system, and the nucleons or the nucleus is going to be extremely light against this fixed uh, Higgs potential that you would have. So the interaction Lagrangian is basically a very simple form, and then you just study quantum scattering. Uh, you could use partial wave analysis, or uh, you could just look at the S wave states. Uh, expected based on the uh, estimates that we have. These are fairly heavy objects. If you chose those parameters, could you have chosen different parameters based on the uh, Meaning make them very light? No, whatever you want. So yes, we first try to make them very light and keep them satisfied by the current constraints. But uh, it doesn't, also they are not very stable because you need Q to be large. So it's, it's a tight system. So it pushes out in a heavy uh, regime. So what's the minimum mass required for it to be stable? Uh, let's see. I don't remember the number, but well, it's not really a minimum mass. It's more like a relation between these two. But you indicated 5p. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because you want Q to be around 100. And uh, so the masses, so from, because M5 is constrained from colliders to be around, a, say, around say, 100. So these, it pushes these to be fairly heavy. So the other very strong constraint comes from the direct, direct detection. detection. Yes. My question is, is it 5 dB comes from stability or comes from, um, from uh, 5 TV is from the stability. So this dependence on the mass from lambda phi h, which is to the power of 14, is that? Right. Is yes. Yes, we actually calculated this number. 14. Yes. Okay. This, this is a very important, yes, okay, good catch. Very this sensitive. is a very big model dependency. Very sensitive. It's very sensitive. So when you vary from two to nine, you really change the by orders of magnitude, yes. So in principle, you are spanning a big range of dark matter parts. Yes. What are the reasons for the upper limit of lambda? Why is nine? Well, this is perturbative. It's, I mean, usually you just take it four pi, but uh, we, when we were calculating the phase transitions, so we, we, uh, we basically did scans for all the parameters, all the way to the... the relativity is not necessarily the limit, right? It's, it's in principle... Well, because you're doing one loop calculations, if you want your one loops to be fine, you want to compare it with the second loop, and... Uh, but that, that's for sure guarantees the perturbative calculation. Anyway. Yeah. But it does mean that theoretically, 
if you know how to do non perturbative calculation for the so finite potential, not, I guess. There is some constraints in some sense. It is uh, just our constraints by the CPUs. Okay. Because I'm theoretically. I mean, yeah. No, but I mean, this formula, n phi versus lambda phi to 14, that is not quantum mechanical, or is it? What this? No, this is yeah, not quantum. No, this is classical. Right? This is classical. This no. is classical, so, yeah. so then it comments apply. I mean, why would you care about This is classical, but uh, how you generate these objects is uh, from you're using electroweak phase transitions, and there you're computing one loop cal uh, contributions to your Higgs potential. Because without it, you cannot get a first order phase transition. You need uh, the one loop contributions. So that's why I have to go to nine. That's why I don't go beyond this value. Well, no, I, I just, okay, you, you okay. found a calculation that generates some, uh, some diagrammatic balls. But in principle, if I have a hot enough uh, and dense enough um, initial condition of these scalars, I will generate this. As the universe cools down, I'll generate this. Yes. I don't know how many, but I will definitely generate some. And, and then, you know, in fact, you, you expect somehow naively that you will get more if the coupling is, is large. larger. So, uh, so indeed, I don't think there's any reason to, to put a bound on it. Mm, yeah, I mean. Oh, let me ask you this then. In the uh, Schrodinger-like equation that you solve, you have an attack with potential. Is that the one loop effect? No, that's just that is just the Higgs profile, no? Have you ever used a one loop effective potential here for some calculation? Yes, we have used it uh, in producing these dark matter balls in the early universe. So to explain how you get the right abundance, the yield, uh, you need it. To make sure you get the right freeze out, you so need it. You have to have this. You have to have this. So yes. If, if you don't put this, then the story doesn't add up. And the two comes from stability, right? With lambda bigger than two. No, the two comes from the fact that if you go to lesser values, you don't have an electroweak phase transition. Okay. So only above two, you can have a first order phase transition. And that is how you could produce this symmetric, asymmetric part. And nine is just coming because we have to trust our calculation and so we have to put this limit. Yes, so uh, we estimate uh, the cross sections for the dark matter, scat dark matter ball scattering of the nucleus or a nucleon. And uh, well, we are uh, using like this here, the estimates are scaled with uh, dark matter balls of masses of between 5 to 500 TeV. So that's why there is the scaling relation here. And so they have uh, they depend on m, but not m not linearly, but, but on m raised to 2.1 in this fashion. Okay, so we use this uh, estimate to extract. Uh, constraints from the xenon one ton bound, which we know that uh, for the spin in independent cross sections, we have uh, constraints from them. And so we see that the TV mass dark matter balls are already excluded by dark matter direct detection. And because this cross section increases with the mass faster than the scaling law, we see that it basically, uh, all the models for low masses would be excluded by direct detection all the way to 2.8 times 10 to 18 GeV for xenon, one ton. And this, is, uh, this constraint is slightly different for borex xeno. And so that pushes it even three orders of magnitude higher. So you have to look at very heavy dark matter balls. Otherwise, we should have seen them. Then uh, what about the collider searches? So, um, if mass of this phi free state is less than half of mh by two, then you could have Higgs decay into 
pi particles. And then you would have an invisible uh, branching ratio for the Higgs. And we have constraints on that. And uh, because we know that the dark matter we have, dark matter balls we have here are formed from first order phase transition, so you have a constraint on lambda phi h, and so that ensures that m phi is greater than m h. You could have three body decays, so you could have off shell Higgs mediated two dark matter particles, and a jet could be produced. But we made estimates and we saw that you wouldn't really have any uh, events for it, even. Uh, well, at the current luminosity and energy. So you don't have any collider constraints. And the direct detection of phi particle, the free phi, is also not possible. So what is of interest is multiple scattering. So instead of one scattering of the dark matter ball as it passes through the detector, because these cross sections are higher, it interacts with uh, the detector multiple number of times. And so, uh, because these are massive objects, we basically use a geometrical cross-section, which is given by 2 pi r square, r being the size of uh, the dark matter ball. And we uh, estimate what the cross-sections would be. So they scale, uh, they have dependence on the, uh, the self-interaction field uh, lambda phi on omega, which was uh, a free para parameter, but you have certain specific values depending on the charge and the mass and the mass of these objects. So what we found was that if you want, uh, because we have large cross sections, or the ordinary way in which this underground dark matter direct detection occurs, it would be very, uh, it wouldn't be sensitive. What you need is a large exposure time and a, a, a good area. So you basically need a product of the time versus uh, an area to be very large. And so the dark matter would recoil multiple number of times, and then you could have some characteristic signature. Okay? So why do you need multiple scattering? Just one would be enough. Well, because it's cross section as I, it doesn't just interact once, it does interact many times. So uh, there are several experiments where you can have multiple scattering of dark matter balls. Uh, before we go into the standard experiments, there's something non-standard, which is the mica constraints. So there are these ancient mica minerals which are lying on the earth. And if uh, the, the cross-section divided by the mass of this object is low, then you could have these dark matter balls penetrate a few kilometers deep into the earth's surface, and they should be leaving some marks on mica mineral. Of course, nothing has been observed yet. However, there's still some constraints coming from these ancient minerals. Just a track. Yeah. But it's the, I mean, geologists argue that it's obviously not possible to uh, say that these tracks would be coming from dark matter, but still, we like to put constraints depending on. Uh, non-observation. And there are a few more different uh, minerals which have been proposed to be used for dark matter pulse. But what different about dark matter? I mean, why would you see only tracks of dark matter and not something else? Exactly. That's what the geologists say, that it wouldn't be possible. Any particle, right? It could be any particle. Well, a, any particle which doesn't interact for so long and then leaves a mark. So there are only a few things right. which would go in deep underground regions. Cosmic ray neutrinos, well, no, they would already interact. No, they wouldn't. I don't think so. Yes, yeah, so they would just pass through the Earth. They probably wouldn't interact with my... Well, I mean, the way you detect them is because you <laughs> built large tanks on the ground and from... Uh, this mica is big. Mm -hmm. This mica crystals are like this. Yes, it would just pass uh, through, I, mean, I would assume. Yeah, so there's a small probability. Well, okay. Yes. I mean, it's the same for, for, for dark matter. I mean, why would it, it interact with the small things? I guess you um, could put so a constraint. Happen, no? 
but you cannot uh, you cannot differentiate between them. So it's not really a very good way of uh, detecting, but it's a way of constraining. So uh, the standard ways are, uh, of course, using the usual direct detection methods. So you have a xenon one ton uh, experiment where you would have basically these. So there's this track which is left behind by multiple scatterings inside this detector. And the number of scatters that you would have per transit basically depend on the target number density, which is the density of the xenon, the cross section of uh, the dark matter balls with the xenon nuclei and the detector dimensions. And uh, based on that, we are basically able to derive what uh, the upper bound uh, would be for the xenon one ton experiment. And we use similar relations to extract information from borax xeno, which is another underground experiment. Uh, it's a, for neutrinos actually, but you could again set constraints for these dark matter balls also. So this is around 10 to minus 22 centimeters square. And uh, even for future detectors like uh, Juno, and also for ice cube, which I don't mention here. So in the end, you basically have the following uh, plot for dark matter detection. So uh, the masses of these dark matter balls are going from 10 to 14 to 10 to 34 GeV. Okay, these are fairly massive objects and they're already constrained in this region. MIGA constrained, you may or may not take it seriously. So this is the dark matter candidate which we have for these parameters and you vary uh, lambda phi h, so that allows you to vary the mass of this object and hence the cross section. So anything here is still allowed for. So. It's, it's underground. It's, I mean, it's just the mineral present in the earth. Yeah. So, I mean, it's... What's the size of this 10 to 14 centimeter? Uh, 10 to 34. So, 10 to minus 6, six centimeter. So, it's bigger than none of the other objects. Yes. These are, these are classical objects. Yes. The point is that the, the, this interaction is, in principle, is quite strong. 10 to the minus 6 is, 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 is quite a strong interaction. The question is that in the early universe, this dark matter is actually quite strongly interacting. Would it be participating in the also in the kind of strong interaction? Well, what is the separation between dark matter, which is this kind of weak interaction, and actually non dark matter? I guess, uh, but well, sorry to interrupt you, but I guess stronger weak in terms of cosmology would be depending on the speed of these objects, no? No, I think it's from the strength. Just from the strength? I would. But also the cross section here doesn't have anything to do with the size of the object, it's actually not fundamental. This, is, this depends on the size. Well, here, oh, one, one gram. gram. <laughs> 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 it's 
It's one gram. Yeah. But another question on the left side, uh, it goes below the genome one point. Yeah, it is this corner, right? See, it goes, uh, this red curve goes below the genome. Yeah. Maybe it's also the loud on the, on the small side, because you, you, you told that eventually it can be as light as 5 dB. Yeah, but then I also mentioned, in principle, yes, but then the constraints uh, from direct detection do put it to be at least above 500 TeV. Yeah, but it goes below the genome, and genome says that that's direct translation. Yeah. You see, it goes slightly below the genome limit. It looks like maybe it should be not true, or? Yeah, but since these are estimates, I would take it with a grain of salt, yeah. Okay. But I'm saying maybe there is a window. Maybe the there is a window. Yeah, but this would be like to from 500 TeV, or oh, 500 TeV, sorry. So that is already 10 to 9, 10 to, yeah, I mean, 10 to 11 to, to 10 to 14. Kind of but it's a very narrow window. Okay. Yeah. What, what is overburden? The overburden uh, no, no, the overburden is from, uh, again, from these uh, mica minerals, because they're inside the earth. So from the shielding, yeah. So, okay, with that I can summarize. And so, basically, uh, we, we studied these non-topological soliton states and we found that they can be dark matter candidates in this Higgs portal setup. And uh, this is a macroscopic uh, dark matter and the masses go vary from one to 10 to 10 grams. And these dark matter objects are formed from first out of phase transition in the early universe. Uh, the radius of these objects, so the size of this object, is from 10 to minus 9 to 10 to minus 6 centimeters. So it's classical size object. Uh, the energy density of these balls is sufficient that it can penetrate the Earth without stopping. So you usually want experiments which have large detector size or large exposure time to get uh, any events. And you can set constraints from the existing direct detection experiments. So with that, thank you. Some more questions for Vitik? So, uh, it's been a long time since I uh, actually looked at cue balls, but uh, if I remember correctly, there was an issue. Um, so people were talking about conditions both at low Q and at high Q. So at low Q, because you can think of quantum corrections to the thing, so maybe you deform your condition, but mm -hmm. I think your low Q was high enough, maybe like 30 or something like that. Yeah. So there was no nothing. But I also remember somehow that uh, the, the, the difference, so M min minus M phi uh, Q divided by Q was going to zero at large Q generally. So meaning that the binding energy per particle was was getting smaller as you as you made the object bigger somehow. That's what I remembered. But in your case, I wasn't sure. Was that true or not? Well, let's look at the graph. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, so naively, it looked like not right. It seemed to be maybe linear in Q or something. I don't know. I can't really tell, but it looks somewhat linear in Q at at high Q, right? Is that? Mm. Or maybe it's Q to three quarters or something. So M. I can't remember. You you had the scaling somewhere scaling, else. Scaling, yeah, it's here. Uh, so large Q is what? So well, is okay. You say Q. it's proportional to Q. Okay. So then you have no problem at high Q, but that's. Bizarre, because that would mean to me that, uh, in principle, you can create something of the size of the universe or something, and it would still be OK. Doesn't that sound strange? Yes. I'll have to think about it. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so yeah. it's just strange, but maybe if you if you did things correctly, probably. Uh, 
uh, what is the mass of the uh, scalar field, uh, the, the, uh, this, this singlet? So because the, it, it's also par parameter of the model, right? So yeah, uh, I think there were around uh, more than 400 GeV. So you have lambda phi h as two, mm -hmm. okay? Even if you turn off the bare mass, so it is lambda phi h b square over two, b is 246 square. Is, is, is this, uh, well, 400 GV is, uh, comes from some consideration or you just... No, it's just coming from symmetric breaking. So you have M phi mm -hmm. is just, I mean, I had this relation. There. I see. So, so the Higgs uh, gives the mass to this phi, yes. right? Yes. Yes. I see. Okay. I'm aware of it. Yeah. That, it's just from the Higgs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you, if you turn off the bare mass, yeah. What they're saying that you you have a lamp, value for lambda between two and nine, and yes. it automatically defines the range for the phi, mass for the phi, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Any since lambda is quite large, right? Um, in principle, you can produce this 400 GV guy at the collider. Yes, you can. Um, the question is that is are there any constraints from collider? There are constraints. Yes. Oh. Okay. Did it Which is uh, yeah we had we did briefly look into these because they have been looked at again and again but yes these constraints so usually it's only the very light ones which are ruled out but around 400 and a, a greater it's totally I fine. See. My worry is that since uh, the coupling lambda phi h is quite large yes. there could be some even constraints for 400 but one should check. In principle it looks okay but uh, since the lambda is large. Well, that's my more, my worry. It's double production. It's, it's double payer production. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pair production. definitely payer production. So this this scenario is actually from the collider perspective. People like to call it the nightmare scenario because it's really a very small region. You want first out of phase transition. It should be one step. So if if you make these plots for these parameters, it's actually not a very big region. Well, basically the production mechanism, you radiate this guy, pa pair of this dark matter from the Higgs, and yes. it, it will be kind of mono Higgs production. Higgs goes one way and recoiling pair of phi. Essentially. Probably cross-section is low, but one should check. Yeah. More questions for Bitika? So if, if you're interested in, in dark matter, there's going to be another seminar tomorrow at 2 p.m. by Sasha. On dark matter in collider physics. Um, so you're all invited to come. I think it's uh, third floor. Third floor, room three. Room three at, at 2, 2 p.m. Right. So um, if there are no further questions, so let's thank Bitika again. <laughs> and if you have more questions for Bitika, I have to ask uh, pretty soon because she's, she's leaving. <laughs> and there should be some refreshments. Uh,